Hello, I'm Shannon Tiazzi for The Diplomat, and I'm very pleased to be here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where I'm joined by Dr. Michael Green. Dr. Green is the Senior Vice President for Asia here at CSIS and also a professor at Georgetown. Thank you so much for joining us, Thank Dr. You. Green. He's going to be walking us through some of the issues in the current fraught relationship between China and Japan. So I wonder if you could provide for us just a little bit of historical context. Um, everyone is obviously talking about this tense situation between China and Japan. How new is this actually? Have there ever been periods like this before in their post-World War II relationship? The tensions really uh, began um, in the mid-90s uh, because the entire geostrategic context changed. Um, uh, in the first part of the Cold War, before the U.S. opened to China, uh, Japan always wanted to be a little closer to China than the U.S. was while allied with the U.S. And then in the second half of the Cold War, Japan cooperated quite closely with China for their mutual economic benefit and to counter the Soviets. By the mid-90s, both sides woke up to the fact that the structure of politics in the region had changed. And in many ways, they returned to an earlier pattern of, of, uh, of Asian relations, which is very hierarchical, where either Japan or China were the top dog in the region. And uh, for most of the history, of course, it was China. But for most of, um, of modern history, it was Japan. And as Lee Kuan Yew, the uh, Singaporean leader, put it, uh, Japan and China were never really powerful at the same time. And from the mid-90s on, uh, both were roughly powerful at the same time. And so it's a kind of jockeying, uh, very, very historically um, deeply entrenched um, in Asia's hierarchical system of international relations between two countries that have either been on top or below each other throughout history. So when we look at the tensions between China and Japan, it's easy to focus on their territorial dispute uh, of, over the Senkaku or the Diaoyu Islands. But how much of this tension can actually be blamed on that? Like, if we imagine a world where those islands did not exist, it sounds like we would still be seeing a lot of tension due to geopolitical struggle. I think the larger geostrategic um, context uh, means that even if there was no dispute over the Senkaku or Diaoyu Islands, there would still be tension between Japan and China. Um, on the other hand, I think uh, it's a, a huge mistake to simply dismiss this as a few rocks that Japan and China are fighting about for nationalistic reasons or historical animosity. The Senkaku or Diaoyu Islands are part of the first island chain. Um, islands that run from Japan through the Philippines um, which are of enormous strategic importance, not only to Japan, but to the U.S. and other maritime states. But from China's perspective, that's also their near sea, uh, the direction from which all the threats in the 19th and 20th centuries came, Britain and France in the Opium Wars, Japan, and then U.S. containment in the early Cold War. So the Chinese have their own impulse to dominate or at least exert more control over their maritime flank. And in so doing, are expanding right into an area that Japan considers absolutely vital to its own survival as a maritime nation, and that's important to the U.S. and Australia and other maritime states. So this is a geostrategic uh, tension where the disputes or um, maneuvers around the Senkaku and Diaoyu Islands are the focus. But this is not just a nationalistic fight over who owns rocks and a matter of pride. It's about who controls one of the most strategic uh, sea lanes and uh, maritime areas on the globe. So this geostrategic um, calculation is obviously not new, um, neither is the territorial dispute, and then obviously historical animosity has 70 years of history. So why are we seeing these tensions really get ratcheted up at this particular moment? And does this have anything to do with uh, the new leaders we have both in Beijing and in Tokyo? Um, both Xi Jinping and Abe Shinzo are maritime thinkers. They're, they're close to their respective navies. They think about these issues in geostrategic terms. Uh, so that's a factor, but it's not the main factor. I think the main factor right now is, uh, is on the Chinese side, and that is that um, the Chinese uh, over the last uh, 15 years have been um, trying to build up their maritime forces um, to have more control over this flank um, part of what stimulated thinking in the Chinese side was the 1995-96 crisis over the Taiwan Straits when China bracketed Taiwan with missiles to um, deter uh, Li Dongwei, 
the leader at the time, from moving Taiwan towards independence. The U.S. sent two carrier battle groups through the area, um, which was supported by Japan and many other countries, and the Chinese didn't like it. So they've been building up their military capability to deny the U.S. that kind of easy access, um, while at the same time using coercive tools, um, more uh, assertive um, uh, maneuvers by their Coast Guard ships, by their aircraft, to try to um, get Japan to um, acknowledge China has a claim and to get Japan to cede uh, some of the um, control over this area, which for most of the post-war history, China had no capability um, to exert influence over. But now they do, and they're building it very, very quickly. And the U.S. and Japan, because historically this is such an important area to us, is not ceding. And that's what is at play here. It's not just nationalism over a bunch of uninhabited rocks. Mm -hmm. So now, the million dollar question. <laughs> How likely do you think it is that we're actually going to see a conflict in the next five to 10 years between China and Japan? I think the possibility of either an accidental collision or use of force, uh, or um, a Chinese decision to um, uh, rapidly accelerate and, for example, actually land on one of the islands, is less than 50-50, but you know, above zero, it's somewhere in the low teens maybe or below, would either an accidental collision or a deliberate Chinese grab of the islands um, uh, cause a larger war? Probably not. There are a lot of pressures against escalation. But it would fundamentally change um, assumptions in Asia about stability and economic prosperity and a rules-based cooperative order. It would really shake things to the core and the knock-on effects of that are quite worrisome. Um, uh, a small microcosm of this, for those who think this is unthinkable, happened in the Philippines, a much less powerful country than Japan, but still a U.S. treaty ally. The Philippines and China were tussling over Scarborough Shoals. The Philippines tried to exert control over it. They had always fished in those waters. China had no navy that could, could challenge it. Um, and the Chinese uh, prevailed, and so now Philippine fishermen who uh, you know, fished in these waters for millennia can't go there. And the Chinese have effective control now over the Scarborough Shoals and the water around it. So it happened in the South China Sea against a much weaker state. It's not unimaginable that that could happen to Japan. And if it did, the ripple effects in terms of assumptions about stability, American power, Chinese intentions, could be really quite destabilizing. But the idea of you know August 1914, where do you go from zero to full war in a few months, extremely unlikely. Now, in the example you just cited of the Philippines, which is also a U.S. ally, um, the U.S. did not intervene to uh, challenge the Chinese control of the Scarborough Shoal. If that similar situation played out over the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands, do you think the U.S. would get involved? Absolutely the U.S. would get involved. Would the U.S. fire shots in anger? A much more complicated question. I think. Um, there are big differences worth noting. Uh, Japan is a, um, uh, an ally that has U.S. bases, that has um, a close uh, uh, defense relationship, not a joint and combined command relationship like we have with Korea or NATO, but nevertheless very close, especially with our navies. And so China was able to sort of work between the U.S. and the Philippines, between Manila and Washington, in a way they couldn't in Northeast Asia. It would be much harder to sort of separate Japan from the U.S. Um, and so the U.S. would be involved. Uh, would the U.S. You know, engage in a war? That's, that's a much more complicated question. But Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty uh, applies to areas under the administrative control of Japan. And the U.S. government determined some time ago that these islands are under the administrative control of Japan. So any Chinese user of coercion or force automatically involves the U.S. How is a very different question at a minimum, much closer defense cooperation uh, between the U.S. and Japan going forward. So we've been talking a lot about conflict. Um, let's talk a little bit about the opposite. Do you see any way for China and Japan moving forward to kind of pull back from the brink and ratchet down these tensions to a more manageable level? You know, I think the, the geostrategic uh, friction and competition is not going away. Uh, in part because I think the assumption in China is that they're winning and time is on their side, um, and the Japanese are unwilling uh, to cede that point. So I don't think strategic level compromise is going to come out of either country. 
but a kind of modus vivendi, a kind of management of the issue to lower the danger of accidental conflict, um, I think is quite possible. Um, it will involve a number of factors. Um, the um, Japanese will not make any diplomatic concessions as long as the Chinese are using coercion, you know, flooding that region with fighter aircraft and patrol craft to try to get Japan to cede um, uh, administrative control or at least demonstrate to the world that Japan doesn't have administrative control. But Japan's not going to make any diplomatic compromises as long as China does that. So one element will have to be some standoff of forces. Uh, which is mostly the Chinese, but the Japanese as well. Another dimension would involve a summit. Uh, Xi Jinping has refused to see Abe for a variety of reasons. Uh, I think the Chinese, if they want to move forward, will have to do a summit so they can actually demonstrate to their peoples that they're moving in the better direction. Part of it's going to have to involve public diplomacy. Both peoples, in recent opinion polls, have a very negative view about the others. 90% have a negative view of China and Japan, and about 90% have a negative view of Japan and China. So that dimension is important. Other things like fisheries. Japan and Taiwan also have disagreements. They largely lowered the temperature by reaching an agreement to share fishing. Uh, so there are many, many dimensions to this. All those pieces would have to come together. Um, right now, both Abe and Xi Jinping benefit to some extent by having a bit of friction on this issue because they're both engaged in economic reform, which is hard. So a little bit of nationalism and a little bit of tension in an ironic way makes their job, number one, which is the economy, a little bit easier because they're taking on vested interests. But at some point, I think they both will recognize too much of this actually undercuts our focus on the economy. Will that come this year? Will it require a crisis? I don't know. But once they have that realization, I think the ingredients are there to start piecing together a modus vivendi, not a resolution, but a way to at least lower the temperature and avoid the, uh, or, or lower the chances of uh, collision or crisis. Now you mentioned both China and Japan, their main focus is the domestic economies, keeping those going. Uh, are we going to see this crisis start to really threaten China-Japan economic cooperation? Uh, for example, the negotiations over a China-South Korea-Japan trilateral free trade agreement, which seems unlikely to happen with China refusing to meet with Japanese officials. Well, um, Japan and China do have enormous economic interdependence. Um, in relative terms, uh, China is becoming a little less important than it was. The new statistics show that Japanese are investing more in other parts of Asia because they're nervous about China. And for the Chinese economy, Japanese investment, while enormously important, is not growing as fast as European or other countries' investment. But they still need each other enormously for economic um, uh, interdependence. Um, the economic actors in both countries have not spoken up in a big way to resolve the crisis, but they could become a force or for, for good, if you will. Um, it's interesting you mentioned the Japan-China-Korea trilateral summit process, um, which would be an opportunity for dialogue and focusing on common economic interests in North Asia. Uh, we in the U.S. shouldn't worry about this, by the way. If anything, we should be happy if they're cooperating economically and not worry about being shut out because the things are so bad right now, that would be progress. It's important because Korea is a variable in this. And right now, Korea-Japan relations are bad. President Park Geun-hye is talking about history, the past, uh, what Japan did to Korea. That plays right into the Chinese narrative um, and I think uh, makes the Chinese leadership view this as a winning proposition right now. Japan has got to amend relations with Korea. Um, the U.S. can help a little bit, but most of the work is in Tokyo and Seoul. I think better Japan-China relations will happen when Korea is not seen as being up for play. Historically, when China and Japan think Korea is up for grabs, it intensifies Sino-Japanese competition. Um, and I think if the Koreans can you know, play this right and if the Japanese can play the relationship with Korea right, that will actually help. Right now, the Korea variable is kind of destabilizing the whole uh, situation. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Thank Green. You. I really enjoyed our discussion. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed it as well. Once again, I'm Shannon Tiazzi from The Diplomat.